What inspires an author who has written a novel about a virus that robs people of their memories? Let's find out. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to All About Books. If you love books, stop where you are and please hit that subscribe button because every week I'll have a new author to interview and you will get to find out what inspired them to write their novel. This week, I'm so delighted to have author Anne Stone with us. Anne teaches creative writing and literature at Capilano University. She has written four books and we'll be chatting about her latest, Girl Minus X, which was published by Walsack and Wynne. And here's a little taste about what Anne's novel is about. The world around 15-year-old Danny and her five-year-old sister, Mac, is collapsing. And if that's not enough, they're on their edge of their own personal apocalypse, being separated by child services. As they flee the city, Danny faces a series of devastating choices. Can she break her aunt out of the prison hospice? And just how much is Danny willing to sacrifice to save her sister? You have to read this incredible novel to find out. Welcome to All About Books, Anne. Thank you so much for having me. My, my pleasure. And what an incredible time to launch a novel about a virus during a pandemic. Like, it's been really strange, right? Like I was just putting this to bed and suddenly we were under quarantine and um, then we, it, uh, the news is coming out and, and then it ended up being delayed for four months because so many of the systems had shut down that were necessary for distribution. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's been a little, it's been a little bit strange. <laughs> I bet. So this novel obviously was well in development before the pandemic, but what, what inspired you to write a novel about a virus that robs people of their memories? Um, yeah, it's a funny thing. I think on the one hand, I have always read, since I was very young, apocalyptic novels. They were one of my... Um, fascinations, right? And I'm really interested in the ways in which I think cultural forebodings and fears get taken up in that genre and play out how that shifts over time, over decades. If you look at what the preoccupations are, it's changing. So on the one hand, I just find that really fascinating. And I think on the other hand, um, I'm really interested in the effects of violence, right, and trauma, and how these um, come to rest in terms of identity and memory. And so somehow all of that came together in terms of this novel. So it's not one of those novels in which people don't feel the effects of the choices that they make or the world around them. I wanted that to rest a little harder. And so in some ways, it, it, it's about what does it mean to have trauma, to carry trauma? What does it mean to remember that well? What does it mean to potentially forget that? So I, I think it was a way to think through a lot of those kinds of questions that, you know, keep you up at 3 a.m. as all books I think ultimately are, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> and your novel is about these two sisters and they, they are, in, they're incredible. Um, when you started right from the get-go, did you know that um, their intelligence would be almost like their superpower? Because these girls, they're not your average smart individuals. Like, they are incredibly intelligent. Um, I don't know. I kind of think that I, I, a lot of the young women that I know a lot of the young women I knew as a young woman, like going through the world, surviving the things that we tend to survive. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of us have intelligence as a fucking super, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's how we get through things, right? Whether or not yes. we've got it on the surface and are showing it all the time, we're navigating stuff constantly. Mm -hmm. and this, mm -hmm. 
taking a lot of um, those kinds of abilities. So I, I, I mean, they have particular gifts, like Danny has a near photographic memory, it's, mm -hmm. it's eidetic, she's really good at remembering, and Mac seems to have the same thing, she's younger, it's hard to know who she's going to be, or, or, you know, she's still quite young, but she also has a mechanical facility, um, and I don't know, I see that, like, my own child has these amazing talents with art, and with, like, mm -hmm visual space that I don't have. And I look at that and it's like, like that's a superpower, <laughs> you know? Um, so I defer decisions to my child about how things are going to, you know, mm -hmm. be if it involves physical space or something because they conceptualize it so much more quickly than I do. So, yeah. <laughs> but um, with these two particular characters. The funny thing is, is that I didn't even know they were going to be the main characters. When I started oh. out, it was actually, there's a history teacher who kind of comes along for the ride as they're trying to get out of this terrible situation. And he, that was the narrator when I wrote the first draft. And oh my goodness. They, they stole the story at a certain point and it just, mm -hmm. I had to rewrite it and I had to give it to Danny because it was ultimately, it was Danny's story. And um, I had to let her be the one to tell it, right? And so she just took over. I didn't know that she was going to, but she did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that. I had no idea because I do think the teacher, I thought he was a really interesting character as well. So, yeah. Oh, I'm glad, yeah. I, I think um, so much is hard for them. I wanted them to have a few places to rest up against where they actually had somebody who was kind around. And yes. so it, for me, it meant a lot to have those people who can make sort of decisions that aren't necessarily um, the bureaucratic decision you're supposed to make in that moment, but the human decision. And mm -hmm. so I, I, for me, I was really I don't know. It feels like they're actual people to me. So I'm kind of like, I'm really glad he did that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They feel kind of real. So I don't know. Yeah. Oh, and do they, <laughs> do they still feel real now that the book's out in the world? Like, did you have trouble letting the girls go? I live with them for a long time. And um, when I'm writing a character and finding that voice that is the character's voice, their way of seeing, they really take up a lot of space. So um, it's nice to have a little more room again, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, but they feel, so they feel like they're out there, which is good rather than sort of living in here. Yeah. Um, Anne, can you read a chapter for us or an excerpt from your novel and just give us a little bit of background as to why you've chosen to read this particular section? Okay, so I, I'm, I struggled a little bit thinking about what to read and I decided ultimately to choose a couple of really short pieces right from the opening of the book that set up some of the dominant questions that are kind of going on more quietly in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so in the very first scene when we meet Danny, the 15 year old um, main character of the book and mm -hmm. her little sister Mac, they are on a hill just approaching a, a prison. And in this world, there's been a slow version of this virus that has affected so many people um, that a kind of warehousing has taken place so that um, I think extent systems are being used or overused in order to deal with this. So we've got structures that are being turned from having been um, basically where the race ha race horses were into um, a kind of hospice slash prison and they're using prisoners to care for people because they're just running out of medical so her aunt having had her parole revoked is at this um, prison hospice and working at it and it's a visitor's day and they've just come to see their aunt so I'll give that a start. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Danny can just make out the ruined rails of the roller coaster, its black bones rising into the sky. 
She knows better than to be here, knows to leave well enough alone, knows the smart thing to do is turn her back and say goodbye. She knows all of this, but it's not so easy letting go of those you love. So Danny takes one step and then another, huffing her way up the hill as her kid sister falls behind. When they crest the hill, she sees the whole of the prison, the old racetrack girded by fences, each topped with razor wire. Where once were horses, she sees infected. Where once were grooms, she sees prisoners in orange jumpsuits and watching over all of them, inside and out, military guards. Below them, scattered across the face of the hill, a dozen little groups, the families of the women they've locked up inside. Some cluster around phone coolers, some sit on what scant grass can be found, and some, she can tell, have given up on the visit. Laid out on old blankets, their faces are tuned to the clouds. They picnic under an apple tree in spite of the mud, in spite of the smell, this close to the fence, the smell of shit and bleach is overpowering. By the time Danny has taken her first bite, her kid sister, sandwich in pocket, has abandoned their muddy blanket. The kid monkeys her way halfway up the trunk and clings to it, looking down at Danny, blinking expectantly. Slowly, Danny rises and makes her way to the trunk, giving the kid a leg up. Mac settles herself into a nook, places her glass-eyed doll, pulls it out of her backpack. The kid takes tiny bites of her sandwich, offers it to the doll, the two small figures framed by a clutch of scrawny buds. She looks peaceful up there in that gnarled old knot of a tree. Nesting there among the apple buds, the kid almost looks safe, but then kids fall out of trees all the time, break arms, dislocate elbows, an unlucky kid might even crack a skull. The letter the prison sent to Danny said this would be a picnic, but there are no birds or dragonflies, no pond for her sister to skip stones into, just a balding hill with more bare spots than grass. And spread out across the rounded side of the hill, a dozen tiny groups, families, friends, the people who belonged to the women locked up with the infected inside. All around the hill, swirling and settling on each of their skins, the sounds and smells of dying virals. Only it isn't virals dying inside of the hospital. Not really. It's people, isn't it? Maybe not legally, not anymore, but Danny knows it. They're people still. Wow. And when you were creating this, this world, like I just, what inspired these, like the hospices and the prisoners taking care of the patients? Like that was just incredible. Where did you get the idea for this element? Um, I'm, I guess, if you think, I mean, I've done a lot. I, I would go into prisons a lot, women's prisons with, um, mm -hmm a group called Joint Effort. So, I mean, we used to go every Thursday after I had my child and I had a job. I, I just, at a certain point it became, I was like breastfeeding and doing all this. So it sort of fell away at that point, but um, I would go in for a long time. And it's to me always interesting to see, I mean, there are these strange economics going in going on mm -hmm. in those places like you're making six dollars and 40 cents a day but there's canteen and if you want hair conditioner you have to buy it right so mm -hmm. there are these really exploitative economies that are going on and then if you look at the supermax prisons in the united states that are for profit i mm -hmm. i can see how in a situation where there's a scarcity of people to do that kind of work that these are the systems that might be turned to and exploited so i i guess i just followed the logic of that world yes. yeah and that's where it led me i mean i'm not living in that world and we're in a pandemic i'm really glad that <laughs> not what i'm seeing here in the sliver of the world i'm really glad of that but yeah so i just i mean i followed that logic but mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, I know. So lucky to live where we live now and not, not an apoplectic world. I think we all live together. So we'll, you know, we have to kind of maybe solve it together. So yeah, yes. we're yeah. all so interconnected and yeah, it's, but I have to say having written this book and then seeing the NDP give the lead in British Columbia to Bonnie Henry and follow silent science, right? I was like, I just was really, I breathed when I saw that. So yeah. 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 So. Um, your novel also explores um, sacrifice and survival on so many levels, you know, what people are willing to do to protect another human being whether it be family, friends, or even, or even a stranger. So what initially drew you to this concept? And did you learn anything from your characters? Um, I think there's like two things going on with that. So maybe I'll... Yeah, so the first thing, what drew you to exploring that concept? Sorry, yes. Um, so I think everything I've written, like this isn't a novel that is on its surface apocalyptic, but I think all the books I've written have been about violence. How do we navigate that? How do we survive that? How do we, um, what impact does it have on identity and um, the stories we tell about ourselves? Like all, how, how does that cluster work? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a way in which um, I explored that with a little bit more distance, just how do we navigate memories of that? What are those, um, really complex ambivalent feelings that we develop about trauma when you want to hold on to it because that's the way you survive whatever's coming you survive by knowing what happened and making sure it doesn't happen again right, right. versus it's you're fossilized if you're holding on at the same time so how do you do that do you can you let go so it was this like writ large way of how do we navigate trauma um and then i think the dominant trope in apocalyptic novels is that, I don't know, we all turn on each other. And <laughs> I don't think that necessarily is what you actually see. I mean, I think we mm -hmm. see it or we perceive that as happening, even when it's not happening. Um, so uh, there's a lot of really what they call pro-social behavior that develops during crisis where people help each other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think, I think we need to think about that. We need to think about how we take care of each other, how connected we are, how we, you know, and we're so in crisis, even without the pandemic, we're so in crisis. How do we take care of each other? Right? Like how do we, um, build a, a way in which we can all be together, secure, caring for one another. So I, I, I guess I wanted to play with the genre, but um, maybe have it look more like that world I think we recognize where your impulse, what's our impulse when something's like really gone wrong? It's like, how can I help, right? Yes. Like they talk about the, um, um, it's the bombing of that American building. It was bombed and they talked about people running around in panic and they were saying they're running into the building. People who are panicked do not run into a bombed building. Those are people mm. who want to rescue others, right? Like yes. that's not panic. That is help that's being offered and not necessarily being perceived as such because of those dominant narratives. So I don't know, I'm really interested in all of that. How, when do we run into the fire? When do we help each other? How do we help each other? And when maybe our, our fears um, and our traumas may be hurtful, right? In terms of what we give to others. So those are hard questions that I, I mean, I'm not happy with my, I'm not finished thinking about <laughs> just thinking about, right? So. Yeah. 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 Well, it, certainly as a reader, you know, I really appreciated those elements of, of, um, of human kindness. Absolutely. And the second part of my question was, um, did you learn anything from your characters? Um, I really adore Eva and her generosity and her kindness and her, um, 
just she's like one of those lights in the world that just mm -hmm. lights it up and like I, I don't know. I, I learned a lot from her. I would think I, I, I admire her a great deal. And um, I would like to move towards Eva. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and Anne, did the book end the way you had planned? Um, it's funny, right? Like the first draft of that book came to me very, very quickly. It took about 11 weeks, um, to wow. write, but it was, you know, let's be real. It was a total mess. And, um, <laughs> there was like a lot, it was like, it was like a version made out of little pieces of straw, you know, mm -hmm. rather than a house you could move into. Yeah. So, um, it took a long time. The structure has been there all along this, the feeling of how it began, the feeling of the middle, the major movements, the feeling of the end, they've been consistent. Yeah. Who experiences them and how they're experienced and what it means have changed a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot more going on at the end of the novel now because of everything it came to mean over yes. sort of Danny's journey through it in a way that is nothing like those early drafts. And so I'm really happy. Like, I feel like books can be smarter than people because <laughs> they can gather up the best of your intelligence on day after day after day and hold it in a way that as people, we can't necessarily hold it. And so I, I love books for that. And I love reading them for that. And it's just amazing to see something kind of take on its own life with these little small ant like efforts you make day after day to kind of mm -hmm. get it there. You know that <laughs> you, you do that, that work too. Yeah. So, um, and what is next? Like, what are you currently working on? I am working on short stories. I had this really, this novel took a long time and at the end I was tired. Like I was like, oh my God, that was hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I wanted to write short stories because I was under the impression they were shorter and therefore easier, which is wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing short stories, but one of the delightful things is that with a novel, it's like this one major project and it takes so long. With these, each of them have their own little world and and so it's like it's really nice to be able to move between them like my mm -hmm. imagination had felt a little bit um like it had been sort of I had set it to a certain kind of work for a really long time and now it's so nice to stretch like it's just <laughs> yeah. um so I'm writing really weird short stories they are sometimes magical sometimes like bizarre things are, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm just like a lot of freedom and fun with the form. And then we'll see what happens. There's still sort of very much information, but um, I wanted to work with that material again. Um, but I wanted to see if I could find ways by, through speculative techniques and through magical techniques of making sure that um, the young women in the stories won in the end a little bit. You know? yeah. So yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. So. Oh, I am, I am intrigued. I am definitely intrigued. And Anne, a great big thank you for coming on the program today and talking about your incredible novel, Girls Min Girl Minus X. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll put links down below in the description box so readers can learn more about you and also purchase a copy of your novel. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. It was really nice to talk to you. So thank you so much. My <laughs> absolute pleasure. And for our listeners out there, please come back next Tuesday because I will have another author and another behind the scenes story. Thank you.